So I didn't really prepare anything, but uh, I just thought of saying a few things. Um, so first thing I should probably say is about, you know, how I got into this career. Um, so in uh, school, I was actually more interested in mathematics. And I thought I would get into mathematics, but um, uh, there was a maths science talent, I mean, maths part of the science talent exam in those days. And my father didn't really want me to get into maths. He said, you should get into physics, a better job prospects. But I kept saying that I want to do maths. So then he made a bet with me. He said, you take this maths um, science learned exam and if you can answer all the problems in this you can go into maths otherwise you should do physics and you know of course I couldn't answer all the problems in the maths paper so I went into physics <laughs> uh, so um, uh, also there were some very good teachers I had in school I was in uh, last three years in school I was in Delhi Delhi public school and we had uh, one particularly good teacher and I think I picked up a lot of my uh, interest in physics from that particular teacher. Uh, then I went to college and I applied abroad after my BSc which was a little unusual in those days but I did it anyway and I went to the University of Pennsylvania first for one year and then transferred to Princeton. Now I had this uh, uh, picture in my head that I really should do high energy physics. You know it's the most glamorous part of physics and uh, there are great names associated with it. I used to read scientific American articles and they would keep talking about Feynman and Gelman and other people like that. So I thought I really should get into particle physics. So when I went to Princeton, I got into that and very quickly realized that, you know, uh, uh, yes, it's an interesting subject, but the best people in the world are working on this, you know, and very soon I realized that, you know, I just cannot compete with these people. It's not just the uh, faculty, it's even my fellow students, you know, some of them had come from, had done their undergraduate in MIT, some in Chicago, some in Harvard. And here I was from St. Stephen's College, Delhi, but it's still a college, it's not Harvard or MIT. So uh, I just, I felt at some point that, you know, this career is really not for me. Uh, so anyway, I, so I did a PhD, but it was not a very good quality PhD. I, I mean, I know where I stand. And so towards the end, I was thinking of what I should do. But one thing I had uh, decided long ago that I'm going to have a career in physics, no matter what. Uh, so if, uh, you know, high energy physics is not suiting me, I better find something else. So then I happened to read an article by John Kogut on spin systems and lattice gauge theory, something like that. And that actually was a turning point. Then I realized that, you know, there are things, there are, um, there's, a, there's this other area, condensed matter physics, where I can still apply things that I had learned in high energy physics, quantum field theory. And so I decided that I'll get into condensed matter, but I didn't have the training for it because all the courses I had taken as a graduate student was in high energy physics. So it took me a few years to make the transition, uh, but uh, being a postdoc in some places, so I, uh, it might interest you to know that even after a PhD in Princeton, I got one postdoc offer. I applied to about 40 and I got one and that was Carnegie Mellon uh, because my PhD was pretty bad, you know. Uh, and after Carnegie Mellon, first postdoc, I applied again to about 40 places, I got one, which is the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, but Edinburgh was a fantastic place because as someone mentioned, uh, there the condensed matter and high energy physicists used to talk to each other. Uh, David Wallace was my mentor. But Peter Higgs was there, by the way. Uh, he didn't uh, say much, but he used to come to all the seminars and chat with people. Um, so that's where I really started making the transition. Um, <coughs> so then I really liked condensed matter. But I was in a, now in a strange situation that I had done a PhD in high energy physics. I had learned some condensed matter on my own. Uh, is anyone ever going to give me a job and in what area? Very fortunately, um, uh, Professor Pashupati here, uh, he contacted me. I don't know how he found out about me. He contacted me and uh, on phone. I think he was in the US for some reason. He called me up and said, are you interested in coming back? And I said, yeah, I want to come back. He said, why don't you apply to ISC? So I, I did that. Uh, so I'm actually quite very grateful to him for considering someone who hardly had any 
good papers in high energy physics, very few papers in condensed matter, but I, he still offered um, a job to me. Uh, in fact, I, when I came to ISC, I had uh, probably about six papers and not more than 10 citations total. And with a record like this, I would never get a job today. Okay. Um, so, you know, I would, I would say that, you know, you have to, like Pashupati, you really have to somehow make your own judgment, not based on the number of papers or citations, but you have to make your own judgment. And uh, so what probably went in my favor is that all my papers, my first 15 papers were all single author. Uh, I have no papers with my PhD advisors, no papers with my postdoc mentors. And so that probably created an impression that, you know, even if he has not done much, he's done everything on his own. Um, so anyway, so when I first came to ISC, uh, that was in 1988, I was actually offered a visiting fellowship. So it was actually kind of postdoc, it was not even a faculty. And it took uh, one and a half years to regularize me as a faculty member. Um, so I, uh, beginning of 1990, there was a, a selection committee meeting held. And um, it was actually to regularize seven people. I was one of them, the other six were all from physics department. And they were, it was a mixture of theorists and experimentalists who were being regularized as faculty. So the expert committee had both theorists and experimentalists. And there's one experimentalist in the committee who kept asking me experimental questions. And I had no clue, you know. And I was also getting very, very irritated. So he would ask, um, how does your work relate to experiments? And I was very brave, I must say, foolhardy. I said, my work has nothing to do with experiments. Um, <laughs> So then he said, uh, do you talk to experimentalists at least? I said, no, I don't talk to experimentalists. <laughs> then I realized I had gone a bit too far. So I backtracked a bit and said, I talk to theorists who talk to experimentalists. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, so Mukunda, Professor Mukunda was in the committee. And he kind of jumped in and saved me. He said, uh, don't worry about him. We are considering him for the Center for Theoretical Studies. You know? <laughs> So that kind of saved me and that person stopped asking me experimental questions. So anyway, that's how he got into a uh, faculty position here in ISC. So uh, one of the things I wanted to tell the young people here is that, you know, you have to be uh, very clear about where you're headed um, and just work for it. Uh, so I knew I wanted a career in physics and even if I did very badly in my PhD, I was not going to give up. Okay. Um, so I did my postdoc, somehow I made a switch, but um, you, you have to really be very persevering, otherwise you don't, uh, you know, you don't reach your uh, goals. And um, as I said, my fellow students in Princeton were very, very good and I, they gave me a real inferiority complex. But when I look back now, I realize that I'm actually doing better than half of them. <laughs> um, most of them, have, many of them have dropped out of academics. And even the ones who are academic, in academics are not doing all that well. So, you know, this is another lesson that, you know, don't compare yourself with others. You know, it might appear to you that people around you are much better than you. But uh, as I say, you know, life is not a sprint. You know, it's more of a marathon. Okay, so um, uh, first few years may not go too well, but eventually you'll, if you really persevere and you're sure about what you want to do, you'll get somewhere. Um, so, uh, ISC is the first proper job I've had and it's the last also. I've never thought of moving anywhere else. Um, and I've had, had a really wonderful uh, time here. Um, very good students and uh, both research students who have done PhDs with me, also core students. Uh, so one of the things that I discovered uh, accidentally but very fortunately is that I like teaching. You know, before I came to ISC, I never had a chance to teach anywhere. Um, so in the PhD, I had I did teaching assistantships, but those were more like, you know, helping people out in the labs and so on. I never actually taught. So, but when I came to ISC, um, I was very friendly with the students, and I um, was talking to a bunch of them one day, and they said, you know, we have never had a course in quantum field theory. Can you teach us? I said, okay, fine. Uh, so I taught a course in quantum field theory. That was even before I actually became faculty here. Um, so that was the first course I taught. And then after the, at the end of the course, I realized that I really like this. You know? 
and then I've taught every semester. I mean, every year one course, and this it's one of the things I really enjoy the most. Uh, so when you're doing research, I've told many many people this. When you do research, there'll be days and months when uh, you don't achieve anything. It doesn't go anywhere, and it's very disappointing. You feel really depressed. But that never happens when you're teaching. Every day you you feel like you accomplished something. You have taught somebody something, and uh, it's a great feeling. Uh, it actually gives me a high. You know, after I teach for the next two, two three hours, I'm on cloud nine. You know, I feel great that you know I've done something nice today. Um, so anyway, so uh, so uh, we were in this center for theoretical studies, which was a building where the earth sciences is now. It was a very small department. And uh, Chitra was my first student, and uh, it's true, she was actually the only student there for a few years, then others started joining. So uh, somebody made up the story of CTS being the Chitra training school. Um, also, I used to be a bit nervous in those days. Uh, I would really worry about, uh, you know, where are my students going to go eventually? Will they get a proper postdoc? Will they get a faculty position? So I used to take very few students. So I would take one. Only when they graduated, I would take the next. Right? So this went on for several years. So in the first 15 or 20 years of my career, I only had four students or so. Then uh, something happened and I decided, I, you know, there's no point in just taking one at a time. So I started taking many more. And so finally I managed to end with 11 students. Um, I like to think of them as my football team, uh, me being the coach. <laughs> I don't know if I'm a good coach, but at least I have a football team. Um, okay, so that's I think covers most of what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, so I, I would say t teaching is uh, probably my first passion. Doing research, uh, dealing with students is the second passion I would say. Um, uh, I owe a lot to many, many people. So I, I always feel that you know I have something to learn from everyone, and of any age. They may be senior to me, they may be junior to me. I learn something from everyone, and uh, I, I make it a point to listen to everyone. Uh, really try to understand what they're saying. Even when the courses I teach, I get a lot of questions from the class, and I never forget a question. So I remember it uh, for years and years. And the next time I teach the course, I take into account that question and I teach answering it. So students are sometimes surprised that how did you know we were going to ask this question? That's because I, I, somebody like you asked this question last year. Uh, so even students in my class teach me something, okay, by asking questions. Uh, so you know, I've, uh, so in some sense, everyone is my teacher, okay. And I really enjoy discussing physics with people. And that's how I managed to do uh, whatever work I've done. The other thing is, uh, uh, this is kind of going a little non-linearly non in time. The other thing is because I did this terrible PhD in high energy physics, that completely killed this idea of working in a glamorous field for me. Okay, because that was a mistake I'd made. That high energy physics is glamorous, I should only work in such things. Once I got out of that mindset, because I did a terrible PhD, uh, then I decided, okay, I'm going to do on, to work on whatever I like. Okay? I don't care if it's glamorous or not. I don't care if others are interested in it or not. If I like it, I'll work on it. And so that's how I managed to uh, work on so many different things. You know, I chat with someone, I get interested in something, then I work on it. Uh, and in the first uh, several years, I would change my field, sort of, every 10 years or so. So I started working on spin systems in condensed matter, then anions, then lattinar liquids, one-dimensional wires, um, topological insulators, Majorana modes. It's all because you know I, I learn something from some paper or talking to someone, and I get interested and I just start working on it. Uh, so I have no long-term goals of any kind. <laughs> I will I'll do whatever I feel like, and if uh, some person feels interested in it, good. Otherwise, you know, I don't particularly care. I, if I like it, I'll just work on it. <clears throat> okay, so I think I pretty much said everything I wanted to say about myself. Um, I should say a few words about... Yeah, so that's the next thing. So I'll end with that. So I wanted to say a few words about Apurva. 
Um, so, you know, many people have said that he's a person of few words and, you know, it's hard, it's hard to get him to start talking. But my uh, my experience is totally different. And I, I have no difficulties talking to him about anything. And um, so I, I'll tell you the story of my first real conversation with him. Um, <clears throat> so in uh, Princeton, when I was a graduate student, I had a very good friend called Alan Gonzalez. Uh, he was from Goa. But in Princeton, he was also there for to do a PhD. Uh, we became very good friends. We used to hang out together all the time. Uh, so then after uh, uh, finishing the PhD, I moved to uh, Carnegie Mellon, then Edinburgh. Okay. And Alan moved. Uh, he didn't do his PhD, but he did a master's in Wharton, was one of the top business schools, management schools. And then he got a job in Procter & Gamble. And he moved to Geneva for a few years. So I was in Edinburgh, he was in, Alan was in Geneva, so I would call him once in a while. So once I called, and he wasn't there, but somebody picked up the phone. And I said, uh, is Alan there? And this person said, uh, he's not here, but I'm his roommate. So I said, okay, uh, fine. Uh, can you please tell him that I called? I'm his, I'm Deep Timan, I'm his friend. I didn't ask that person his name. So he said, okay, fine, I'll tell him. So then one year passed, then I joined ISC. Um, uh, so I see CTS was a very confusing place those days. It had people from all kinds of areas, biology, ecology, atmospheric sciences. And I just joined, I was very confused by the whole place. So I didn't talk to people much, you know, I just do my own work. Um, so Apurva, so another year passed, Apurva joined. Um, and But he was, he had a primary appointment in ACRC, Supercomputer Center joint appointment in CTS, but he didn't come very often to CTS. So I would see him once in a while, but it didn't quite register in my head. Who is this person? Uh, so I think we hardly spoke and uh, several months passed. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, so one day it so happened that we were just standing in CTS somewhere, you know, neither of us really talking to each other and all of it, all of a sudden, he turned to me and said, so how's Alan? Okay, <laughs> this is three years after that conversation in Geneva <laughs> when I called. I said, how do you know Alan? He said, I, I'm, I was his roommate when he called. <laughs> <laughs> so then we started chatting and, you know, uh, so, you know, this is an example where he actually really made the effort to connect. And then we, you know, discussed, we have been discussing things ever since. But, you know, if he had not said that, then we would have probably gone on for many more years without talking to each other. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, the thing about Apurva is that I've actually learned a lot from him. I, there are many, many questions that I've discussed with him, and he always gives very clear and sharp answers, and I, uh, I understand what he's saying. And, uh, I, you know, the quickest way to learn something very often for me has been to just ask him, and he'll tell you exactly what the answer is. Uh, so it's been great to have you as a as a colleague for all these years. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Okay.